Welcome to another edition of ASCAP Screen Time with the legendary composers of the massive streaming hit series Cobra Kai, Leo Bierenberg and Zach Robinson, along with Golden Globe and Grammy nominee Vince DiCola, known for his work in the 80s sequel film Staying Alive and his platinum selling soundtrack to Rocky IV, as well as the iconic 1986 animated feature, The Transformers, the movie. While Vince has been busy for the past 20 years scoring video games, we thought it'd be fun to reflect on the 80s nostalgia that connects you all here together. I'm Mike Todd with the ASCAP screen team and wanted to quickly say that we're all excited to hear you chat about what inspires you and your work that is loved by millions of fans. You've all done such incredibly tasteful and influential music, particularly on Cobra Kai and Rocky IV. So I'd like to start off with the first question and have you all take it from there. Zach, Leo and Vince, how did you all balance using Academy Award winner Bill Conti's themes in your projects while being tasked to score original music? Well, thanks Mike for the intro and Vince, we're so excited to talk to oh, you yeah. about all of oh, this yeah. stuff. Well, thank you, um, thank you guys. We're, we are big, big, big fans. We, like, really we, big should, fans. we should just get that out of the way. Uh, <laughs> Leo, why don't you? Why don't you talk about the Conti, the Conti stuff first? The and then Conti I've got a stuff? question for Vince after that, after he Okay, answers. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, well, a huge amount for us in approaching Cobra Kai, it's based on the Karate Kid. And, uh, you know, that was a movie we grew up with. Um, it's just like, I, I feel like I've said before, it, it's one of those movies that for us was like always on TV. <laughs> like, like if you go over to like a friend's house for a sleepover and you turn on the television, you're like, you can bet that some cable channel is playing the Karate Kid. So you've seen it like a thousand times from different points in the movie. It's just kind of like this ubiquitous, omnipresent, like source of pop culture, it. And, uh, I, I think what made that sort of fun in our approach was that we wanted to figure out like what that was that that like ticked about it that people responded to. Was it a melody? Was it um, some type of orchestration? Was it uh, just like a, some specific color or recurring instrument? And I think it's a bit of a combination what we settled on of all three. Um, and what we sort of did was go back to the original movies and, and deconstruct it and, and and figure out how to take that in a more like ambiguous way and turn it into the score for Cobra Kai. And there were a couple things that we identified, one of which was just kind of like the, uh, in that movie, the, the, the orchestration, the arrangements, they like, they're very specific and they sort of evoke this like spiritual, um, uh, I guess spiritual is a good word for the, for the Mr. Miyagi background story um, and his relationship with Daniel. And so we found ourselves kind of borrowing a lot of the, um, the colors from that sound, but not actually that much material um, because a lot of the material is like pan flute solos and a lot of it is very improvisatory. It, it, it like, it's not the type of thing you can just like pluck out of that score and put in another score and be like, look, it's the Karate Kid. Cause I don't think the audience would necessarily like identify like- any It's not like Rocky. Melody. Yeah, it's not like Rocky, <laughs> exactly. It's not like a melody you latch onto. It's kind of just like a feeling. Um, so that was one part of our approach was like, how do we evoke the same sort of feeling through instrumentation and orchestration as uh, Bill did in the original. And then the other was uh, one thing that struck us about that film and, and films of that era are kind of how the, the pop song soundtrack is like so important to the core of the storytelling in a lot of ways. And I actually think that most people who watch The Karate Kid, when they think about the music that they love from that movie, they think about the songs. And, and some of those songs are co-written by Bill Conti, you know, they, yeah, which was a really cool part of that era, this like song score combo, um, which I think we want to touch on with you in a little bit. But we, just in terms of constructing the sound of Cobra Kai, we really wanted the, the, that pop song, that synth pop sound of the 80s to be as incorporated from a score perspective as like kind of the memory of it felt like it was from the Karate Kid. Um, so that was our approach. It, it kind of came down to what did we think like 
that movie and Bill's score was making the audience feel and how do we kind of hit the same feeling in our way? Imagine guys that your first movie scoring ever is the fourth movie in one of the biggest <laughs> movies. <I've ever> <laughs> And it, you know, <laughs> the nice thing about it was, as I was campaigning for this, Sylvester Stallone knew nothing about it. And uh, I was writing themes, basically, thinking I was never going to get the job. And, and that was sort of freeing because I didn't have anybody breathing down my neck or, you know, Sylvester Stallone saying, I want this or I want that. But, you know, when I found out that I got the gig, um, it was very scary because, uh, you know, number one, never having scored a movie before. And number two, you know, I had to be faithful to the iconic Bill Conti sound for Rocky. And <clears throat> I wanted to do that in a way that I could incorporate my own style and make my own mark on the, and I have to tell you the whole time I was composing and, and recording the demos, I was thinking there's no way this is gonna get over. There's no way, you know, I have these progressive rock elements and, and a, little yeah. bit of, a little bit of Toto and a little bit of the, the Phil Collins drum sound. And, and I thought, yeah. and it was great because I thought, well, I don't care. I mean, I, I know I'm not gonna get the gig, so it's like an exercise for me, you know? The way I ended up incorporating Bill's melodies, uh, you know, people seem to be happy with that. Sylvester Stallone was happy with that. And I think I gave, you know, the proper amount of homage to, to his, his melodies and great melodies. I mean, you know, how important is Bill Conti's music to all the Rocky movies? So I had to be very careful with that. And it's funny that Bill sent over um, a musicologist to the production office to make sure that I wasn't plagiarizing him. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, I guess they were satisfied because we never heard anything more about it. But yeah, for me, it was um, it was a great exercise and um, scary when I first got the when I first got the call that I was going to be scoring Rocky Four. But then things just kind of moved so quickly. I didn't have time to be scared. I didn't. I just you know I had to write the music and, and get it done. But um, Bill Conti was certainly a big part of the of the inspiration. That's incredible that we actually have such similar experiences I think with our respective properties that we've been working with and like these legacy these legacy like IP things um you kind of touched on this the thing that I'm the most interested in hearing you talk about just as a fan of yours is is like what was your inspiration going into scoring a movie like Rocky Four? for us like doing Cobra Kai like the Vince DiCola soundtrack to Rocky IV is a really big inspiration and we're always talking about you know, how like we're making the montage cool again and we're, and we're like doing it in a sincere way because we love it. And we, we, you know, your work is a huge part of that. So like, we're, we're kind of grabbing from that like eighties movie music canon, uh, which we are very well versed in and just like study and research and love. But like, I would love to hear like, what were, since there was no eighties montage verse, when you were writing Rocky Four, like I can hear the progressive rock elements. Like some some of your stuff almost sounds like an ELP record or something. Like, Thank you. like wh nice. where were you? Where were you like getting your influences from? And also, like, yeah, like how did you get it past Sylvester Stallone and everyone and say like this should be in your multi million dollar blockbuster movie? Uh, boy, you know, like I say, it was the whole time I was writing, it was, it was, I'm not going to get this over on it. <laughs> you know, when I moved out to California in 1981, my goal was to be a session musician. I had no thoughts of writing music for films or, or songs or scoring or anything like that. And one of the biggest motivating factors for me to move out here was the band Toto. I mean, that, you know, the fact that you got all these great session musicians together in one band not only playing great, but writing great. And uh, I have to say, when I started Rocky IV, there were three elements that, that I drew from. And one was the keyboard elements of Toto, Steve Piccaro and David Page, they big inspirations, who were also influenced by Keith Emerson. And that was the second influence for me is, is you know, 
there's always one band we can all point to as being the motivating, the most influential uh, uh, musical factor to our, our music, the music that we write in our careers. And Keith Emerson is it for me. And uh, mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was probably the main element. You know, he has this great uh, synth brass sound that, that everybody loves. And, and when, when Toto did the song Rosanna and they had that great keyboard solo, they drew from that. And I drew from that for, for you know, kind of bringing a, a, a more progressive modern element into Rocky music. So the three elements for me that influenced me on Rocky were the, the Toto keyboard sound, Keith Emerson, and at the time that big Phil Collins drum sound was coming into Vogue, you know, and it was, it was, um, I, I definitely wanted to bring the drums and the rock elements to the forefront. And that was kind of the difference between Bill Conti's style and mine. And, and that's another reason why I thought, well, I'm never gonna get this over because this is rocking as, a, as opposed to more traditional. And I remember when Jeremy Lubbock came in to orchestrate, he got it right away. He said, Vince, he said, I think the orchestra should support the synthesizers, not the other way around. Mm. So that was the approach that we took. And I am amazed, and, and even more so on Transformers. Transformers had, you know, I think many more progressive rock elements in it and changing time signatures and synth colors and all that stuff. So, you know, luckily with Transformers, I had already made an impression on the producers with Rocky IV. So I came into it kind of with, an, with that advantage. But yeah, as far as um, inspiration and influence, it was those, those three elements that really uh, played a big role for me. Uh, I just wanna say kind of in response to that, I think one thing that really draws me into the Rocky IV soundtrack that I like really associate with it is like how like virtuosic it comes across. Like there is some serious freaking shredding going on in there and I, like to me that really like makes it tick in a lot of ways like and it, and it brings like a totally new um i it's it's just like another approach to the material like in addition to like bringing in the bigger drum sound and and different synthesizer sounds like i i think just that that kind of virtuosic approach to the to the actual like writing and parts is um it makes it just really fresh and 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 uh it's my favorite rocky score of all rocky scores like and uh and so it's it's really interesting to hear you talk about that well i i want to hear what your guy what your influence was for cobra kai because i listened to you know last night i listened down to season three all the cues and it's funny to hear the the common ground you know between Rocky and Cobra Kai and um, Karate Kid and all that. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing what influenced you guys. That's part of the fun of the show is that we have a lot of influences and we somehow get approved to, yes. to <laughs> utilize all those influences. But yeah, I mean, especially on season three, like on the album, listen, do we, the, the opening of the album is like a metal arrangement of Bill Conti's Miyagi theme. Um, which is the finale piece in our, in our in season three, as Leo touched upon all, all of, of, of Tanti's kind of traditional orchestral styles and colors was another influence. And then in season three, we go, we, you know, we draw from John Williams and our big finale pieces. We draw from obviously you and some of our montage pieces. And um, we're just kind of constantly like trying to, include more kind of like 80s influences into our music wherever we can like we had we had some stuff on our album like this random track called web md is very kind of police stuart copeland like <laughs> like hey. weird arrangement thing um but yeah that's we're we're just like always amazed that we just get away with it <laughs> that like we're, yeah. we're able to that like and especially now going into season four it's like like we're always kind of pushing it and we're saying like is this going to get approved and, and major credit to john josh and hayden who are the showrunners of the show who have been incredibly open to our to our vibe and kind of what we're trying to bring and we're all on the same page but i i, I think it's pretty amazing that like the 80s sound and the aesthetic 
like I'd love to hear you talk about just like the, the complete revival of of the of all those types of sounds and genre the genre and it just being in electronic music like in pop music um and I know that like you're playing live a lot more and like there's a resurgence and like people seeing your you perform and just like a wanting to see and bring back these types of sounds like how do you feel about how, having all these years pass well I think the first um example that I saw that the 80s sound was coming back on TV at least was Stranger Things mm -hmm. uh, and since then I mean I had I had a funny experience uh, a couple of years ago I, I'm sure you guys know this this the uh the show American Horror Story and one of their season names was 1984 and I remember sitting watching TV I, I wasn't aware of this in, until this happened and I was sitting in my chair watching TV and I fell asleep and I woke up because I heard far from over and I'm looking on the TV and it's the opening of American Horror Story that they use the whole dance sequence from Staying Alive with, with Far From Over. And it was just, it was funny, but it was also cool to hear how they, how they, they kind of used humor um, from, the way they joined the 1984, the way they represented the 1984 music and the whole style of filmmaking and everything. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I was really excited because here I was a, a, a synth guy, you know, a synth rock guy from the seventies, basically. That's what I, that's the year I grew up in. And, and then when, when I had a chance to do those movies in the eighties, I had a, uh, an opportunity to bring the 70s elements in to the 80s. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about, and I think it's still going on, this resurgence of, of 80s, the 80s musical style, and I'm excited about that. When I, when I did Rocky and Transformers, I was placed in a room in, in the studio, in Scotty Brothers' studio, that had every synthesizer up to that point that was in existence and including modular synthesizers. And it was like a candy store for me. So um, recently we brought that stuff back over at my partner Kenny's studio and we're gonna we're gonna crank that stuff up again and, and yes and, you know, <laughs> yes and, and just just get it going again. And and uh, I'm excited about that. I mean I'm you know we have our friend Casey Young who was who was the guy that programmed all the synths for Rocky IV and Transformers. And, and we put him up in a room over here at my partner Kenny's studio in Burbank. And he brought all his gear in. And I, you know, here I am looking at the big Moog modular synthesizer and the EMU modular synthesizer and all his gear. And just looking at it gets exciting, you know, it, it, it inspires. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the resurgence of, of 80s music. And I have to say, and I think we both all three of us share this. Uh, somebody mentioned how songs were incorporated into scores. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it's, I don't know that it's as good now as it was when we, when we were doing the eighties music. Um, the songs seem to have more to do with the storyline back then. I don't know I, today that it's that prevalent. Many times when I'm seeing a movie and a song comes up at the end credits, it's like, Okay, I knew they did they they did that specifically to get a hit on the radio, but what does it have to really do with the with the storyline? So, you know, in Rocky, uh, my manager at the time was the music supervisor. His name was Robin Garb, and he was you know very instrumental in getting all those acts, all those artists, all those producers and songwriters together, and. I think they came up with a, a great winning formula that tied into the storyline of Rock Before. Um, and going down the list of Cobra Kai and the songs that were used in that, it seems to be the same. You know, it's, it's, it's fresh for me to see that, that these songs have a lot to do with what's going on on screen instead of just, here's a hit song, you know, so. Yeah, and like you, it wasn't even just like lyrically, thematically, like you were able to, you were able to tie in themes from your, like your, your thematic material for Rocky um, from the score, you're able to tie it into to songs as well, right. which since is kind of original like, to the movie. Right, since they're original to the movie, which we, we really admire and we feel like is kind of a lost art. Like, yeah, and, and Conti, like, Conti did the same thing in Karate Kid. 
with with all his songs and his themes they're right. they're like intertwined completely right yeah i feel like outside of your big like animation musical these days like that does not happen at all and it's so like it, it's such a cool approach to just film and music when when you can kind of thematically relate that stuff in a more like pop music sense i think right. than than when you just like oh here's like the theme you know, from the orchestra song that we just heard, like still in the orchestra as like score, like that's great. It, that's a great way of writing that, uh, you know, I admire a lot, but it's uh, it's not the same as, as what you guys did back in the eighties. Well, you know, um, when I, my first big gig after moving to California uh, was, well, my first connection was Frank Stallone, who was Sylvester Stallone's brother. And Frank was, was given the opportunity by his brother to write and submit songs for the movie Staying Alive. And Frank came to me and said, do you want to write some songs with me? And we can submit it for this movie. I had never written a, a vocal song up to that point. And I could, have said, I could have said that, but thankfully my brain kicked in and said, oh yeah, <laughs> let's do it. You know, it's, can't wait. And uh, doing that, you know, there were, we had seven songs in that in, in we ended up with seven songs and far from over. And that was a great exercise for going into Rocky four. And, you know, I really didn't have, I only had one vocal song in, in uh, Rocky, which was hearts on fire that I wrote with our friend, Joe Esposito and, and our friend Ed, Ed Fruge, who was my co-producer on Rocky four and transformers. And it was, it was, you know, that whole training thing I had it in, in, going into Rocky IV, I had it in mind. I had the advantage of having seen three other Rocky movies that had training scenes in them. So I kind of knew, you know, and of course there was uh, Eye of the Tiger and, you know, I, I had all these influences in my mind when we were writing Hearts on Fire. And once again, that might be the example, the biggest example of, you know, if you want to say virtuosic, keep with it. it it's just like, again, there's no way that they're going to dig this. I kept think, thinking, to myself, no way am I going to get this over. Um, but thankfully we did. And in fact, the demo that we did with Joe, um, I, I took the keyboards even further for the final version. And because I got, I, I was encouraged by the fact that people were responding positively to this. <laughs> I can you know, do more. Awesome. I can shred more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that you know, I I'm really I'm really proud of how Hearts and Fire Hearts on Fire fits into the whole training scene um, and ties in with training montage. You know, that was uh, which was the first piece, by the way, on my demo tape for Rocky Four. That was the wow. first piece that that Sylvester Stallone heard and and. Uh, uh, from what I, from what my manager tells me, thirty seconds into this, into the song, he jumped up out of his chair and said, "Who the f is this?" Whoa, and <laughs> that's and legendary. It, it, yes, it was, it was just, um, it was amazing. And and then, like I say, when I got the call, I was um, really excited but terrified. Again, like I said at the beginning, it was the first movie I scored, and it was a Rocky movie. So wow. But yeah, the way the songs tie in and, and what I got away with on Hearts on Fire and um, it was a lot of fun. You know, once, once I got the terror out of the way, we were able to have fun and, and I had a lot of fun creating the keyboard parts. You know, back then I could play, my, my keyboard technique was much better than it is today. And of course the lack of sequencers back then, I had to play a lot of that stuff live. And specifically on Transformers, it, it was it's amazing to me how well it flowed back then and how how much I struggled now doing that kind of stuff. So when we played, um, we played at the Whiskey uh, three, two or three years ago, and I got a chance to finally play Rocky IV material and Transformers material and very enthusiastic, enthusiastic audience. But it was fun putting that material, even though it's decades later. It was fun putting that material back together again with a with a live band, and great to see the reaction. Again, it was it was a reaction to '80s music and and the '80s era, um, and 
you know, I knew Stan Bush did uh, a, a gig at the Whiskey uh, a few months before I did. So, and his, you know, his show and his music was was received very well. So, I think we're all enjoying this this resurgence of of '80s style. Of course, you guys grew up in it. I, you know, I'm yeah. an old fart here. We so. are we are nah. certainly enjoying it. And you know who else played a gig at the Whiskey is uh, us. You. We did <laughs> we, uh, we did a live version, like a concert version of of the score to Cobra Kai. This was in between seasons two and three, okay. um, and uh, it was a ton of fun. And it actually like uh, really you know it's kind of like the opposite experience where like you are returning to this music after a lot of time we are in the middle of this epic you know karate soap opera right now and uh it, it was actually turned out to be a really fun way for us to develop material between seasons like we spent a solid three to four months putting this show together Believe um it. Because a, a lot of, you know, it, it's, a, it's a TV score. A lot of times our music starts and stops our uh, 30 seconds here, 45 mm -hmm. seconds there. And we'll have a really awesome idea that we're super into, that the showrunners love, that everybody loves, but it's like super short. And mm -hmm. like people will be commenting and writing us notes on the soundtrack being like, oh, I love this song, but like it's only 90 seconds and I have to put it on loop to work out to it. And so we spent, you know, all this time basically, how do we turn these into four minute, like, you know, concert tracks, like really like, yeah. you know, something you can rock out to. Um, and it, it really changed our approach. Uh, one, I think our writing approach a little bit. Um, and two, just we, we ended up with like such more developed material when we were going into season three and like now season four. And that's just kind of part of our off season now, I would say is like, we just start expanding tracks and figure yeah. out how we're going to perform them live. Because... Uh, like you said, like, it's a lot of fun. And I think if there's like one thing that it sounds like we both really have in common and like revere, it's just like having fun when you're doing this. And I think like, for example, like you saying like, oh man, I don't know how this is gonna get approved while you're freaking shredding <laughs> and wailing. And like the reason it gets approved is cause like Sylvester Stallone's listening to it and he's having so much fun cause you're having so much fun. And like, we're having so much fun yeah. listening to it. Like I listened to that training montage before we started this call just to get myself hyped up. Oh, um, <laughs> as you can tell, I'm pretty hyped up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I just think like, I, I don't know, you should be having fun while you're making music. Absolutely, and like, yeah. I think if you're having fun when you're making music, like that's how you make something that people really connect to. Like that's how you get like the soul in there. Um, and so it's really just like nice to hear you say that. Well, yeah. I, I have a, a question for you guys. So you play instruments, obviously. Do you both play keyboards or? Uh... Badly. <laughs> Very yeah. badly. We don't, I, yeah. Is that, go, you, you. No, uh... no, I was going to say we use, uh, it's not like the olden days. We've got, we've got all of all those synths in that room that he was programming. We just have a plug-in that I spent yeah, 50 bucks on. Yeah, it's a new box. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a guitar player and Leo is a, yeah. uh, so I play a guitar and, and Leo is a, uh, a wind player. Yeah. I play okay. sax. Uh, play a lot of Ewe on Cobra guy. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, I think like we, unfortunately I feel like have to wrap it up, but I was going to say, I feel like we've got to get a live show going together. Oh, oh yeah. Great. That'd be fantastic. That I think that's be... a, I think that's a pretty good double bill in I, my I, opinion. I, oh yeah. Peter, get on that. Would you? <laughs> 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 no, that's so brilliant. yeah maybe like you know we look forward to to meeting you in real life and and you know rocking together for sure like yeah, let's, would be so let's, much let's do it i think that would be like an amazing double bill that's um an excellent idea and yeah i'd be into cool it, definitely well thank you vince for talking to us and thanks to ascap and mike and everyone